Welcome everyone. So my name is Louise Regan and uh, I'm a national officer for the National Education Union, but I'm also a teacher. I've been teaching for 30 years. And Rob, uh, a while ago, sent me a message and said, I've written a book. And would you write something about it? So I love books. So he sent me a copy of his book, which I have an actual copy of now. And uh, I read it. I read it very quickly. Um, and it just resonated so much with me. I've been teaching for over 30 years. I know how the system has changed and everything that Rob wrote made me think this is a really important book and we need to keep talking about what is happening to our education system. So I'm really pleased uh, that Rob wrote this, The People's Republic of Neverland. And we're gonna have a bit of a chat. Rob's gonna answer some questions about the book and uh, you can ask questions as we go along. And we may also chat a bit about where we're at now in the education system. So I'm still teaching. So I've uh, been teaching today. So if anybody's got any questions about what it's like being in school at the moment, please feel free to ask. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think it's important that we think uh, and reflect on not only where we're at, uh, but also where we're going and what we can do. Um, so Rob, Yes. What made you write the book? Let's start. Let's start with that. Uh, I think 35, uh, 35 years of teaching just kind of boiled up like bile and a great deal of dissatisfaction with what happened for most of that time um, to something that I thought, I still think is perhaps the most useful thing you can do. And it made me, it, it made me, angry to see the way that the child has been moved to the sidelines and, and reduced to statistics as far as education is concerned. And I, I decided to take early retirement and my way, way forward was to write a book saying how much I hated the government and what they've done, what successive governments have done to teaching and to our children since 1988. Um, so I did that and my friends at PM said, no, that's not very good, Rob, that's just poison and bile. Go away and do it again properly. So I went away and did it again a bit more properly each time until there was a finally a version where they went, yeah, that's okay. That's not entirely poison, bile and spleen. So. I think the poison, bile and spleen is useful. You know, we, we all exist in that situation of feeling that anger. I mean, I think uh, when I read it, uh, I'm like you, you know, I, I, I started teaching just before the national curriculum, just before SATs existed and, mm -hmm. There was this lovely element of freedom and being able to engage with young people and focus on their needs. And I think that comes across really well in the book that we have gone from a system of our children being at the centre, our children and young people at being at the centre of what we do to suddenly them being almost sort of an add on. Mm -hmm. In some ways, they're a bit in the way, actually, if they're not actually conforming to what we want. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just wonder what your views are about that. Yeah, I think one of the reasons I wanted to write the book was increasingly I was finding I was working with people who had no idea that there could be any other way of delivering state education other than delivering um, a curriculum centrally, centrally decided upon by people with no experience of education, no sound pedagogical understanding, but simply a political agenda that they wanted to promote, which is to do with liberalism and monetization of schools and assets but so there were teachers who were teachers started coming to schools who grew up with the national curriculum in being inflicted upon them so had that mindset of there's a right answer there's a wrong answer you're a winner or you're a loser um and grew up with teaching standards which i think is such a, such a shabby little document compared to a fully rounded teacher training course that you know of degree level that talks about sociology philosophy the practical and the and the theoretical aspects of teaching it gets you to be a reflective practitioner you know students were coming in and i'd say of course when i were a lad we used to make it up as we went along and they go god that's impossible how did you do that why how, how did the earth not collapse if you did that so i wanted to write a book to show that there there used to be alternative methods of of running schools. And I think that's something that, again, over the last 30 years, 
the idea that you can have an alternative has been edged out of the political discourse. And the idea that you can affect an alternative, that you can change things, has also been sidelined. I, I, I think we, and the national curriculum has played its part in this, deliberately blunting people's ability to think critically and to think actively and to think of themselves as purely passive and consuming. So I'm going to, you know, I hope the book, hope people will read the book and feel empowered by it and possibly angry because if you hope the book traces the way that these things were done to us and who did them to us. And I think it would be good if people had recovered a bit of poison, spleen and bile as well. Um, but I hope the book presents all those gr other great theor theoreticians, people who actually knew about teaching, people who spent their lives devoted to pedagogy, to making the education better. It's, they're great ideas. They have great ideas. They all got like chopped, chopped off, beheaded and exiled once the national curriculum came in, because that was the only way to do things. That is the only way to do things. And of course it's not. It's just that's but that's what we that's that's what we've been told to do. We don't rebel. Well, I mean, Liz says that poison, bile, and spleen could be your follow-up. So, uh, <laughs> oh goodness, I think that's a good idea. I'm with you, Nick. I think it could be a follow-up. Um, and uh, um, Marcello um, Starikov says you're the most inspirational early years practitioner ever, uh, which is a very good thing to hear. Um, just going, I, I sort of want to just reflect back a bit on what you've just said, actually, because I think the whole issue of teacher training is quite important. And yeah, training. Yeah. I uh, trained over 30 years ago, like you, so I, I did a four year teaching course, did a lot of work around pedagogy, um, <clears throat> also did a lot of anti racist education training at that time, um, yeah. challenging sexism in schools, all of those sort of things. And nowadays, I talk to young educators coming into school. They they just say, "Well, we don't do we don't yeah. do something like that." Uh, yeah. And how 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 do you think we need to turn around our training for our young people mm -hmm. coming into our schools? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the other shabby thing is that there are all these kind of like learn on the job schemes, like apprenticeships. I don't, I'm not against apprenticeships at all, but I'm again I am in favour of proper apprenticeships. Um, and it's not like you're learning to, with teaching, it's not like you're, you're, you're an apprentice to, you know, like you're learning how to mend washing machines or how to install central heating. This, the, the, human, the human being is a bit more complicated than um, even the most complicated washing machine and central heating systems. I, I can't understand central heating systems or washing machines, so I have absolute respect for the people who do that. But, you know, it's, it's different, isn't it? If you want your washing machine, machine fixing, go to Joe Solo. If you want your child educated, that's my skill set. So, so that's, it's not a question of you can do it on the job. I'm, I'm one, of my, one of my son's friends said, hey, oh, do you know, you can be, a t I can be a teacher next September. I just got to read some, do some study over the summer and I can be a trained, I can be working in a school being mentored in September. That's outrageous, isn't it? That's just, that so devalues what we think teachers can do. I would say practically everybody I've met in teaching wanted to make that thing about making a difference, wanted to do right by, by, by children. But of course, if they don't have the opportunity be, to become reflective practitioners, they're not going to know how to do it properly. Um, so how do we change? Oh, how do we change training establishments? Oh, you'd have to ask UCU about that. Let's get UCU out on strike. Uh, for proper co for proper courses, I, I think schools. I'm going to say something that I have absolutely no right to say, but I think schools should not collaborate with those kind of on-the-job training schemes. I think they should. We should, ins you know, we should insist on it being a graduate profession, not because being a graduate is wonderful. You know, it's, it, it won't help mend your washing machine or mend your plumbing, but if it comes to working with people young people, your training should involve opportunities for reflection. So we, we should stop collaborating with cut price, uh, quick fix, let's get bodies in front of classes, solutions. You know, that's, like we do, that's like as a union and as a parent, oh God, as a human being, I don't want children to go to academies where the head has hired his best 
friend's cousin uh, to stand in front of a class and talk about maths or geography just because they'll work cheap. You know, I, I want when I want my when I'm, when we want our children educated, we want people who know what they're doing. And it's not a simple matter. It's not something that anybody can do. If you look at the number of free schools that have cheerily failed, costing us billions of pounds, all that kind of uh, uh, attitude that anybody can do it with a million pounds from Gove or whatever, and uh, a set of knitting instructions from, from, from the internet, you can't. You need to be properly trained for it. I think schools should have the courage to not collude with these quick fix solutions. What do I know? I'm not head teacher. No, so. Well, I think, uh, I mean, Liz has just made a comment in the chat actually, which I think is really important. She says, this is why proper mentoring in schools is so important. Mm -hmm. Mentors used to be given time to mentor new teachers. I learned so much from older teachers when I first started. Wealth of knowledge and experience they have, and I have now, is priceless, literally. And I remember one of the, one of the most cracking speeches, I, speeches I've heard at one of our national conferences was from an older teacher, and she talked about, and we, it was a it was a debate about the menopause, actually, I think. But what she talked about was the value that she gave to younger teachers, but also the value that they gave to her. The things that they taught her about new technology, about new things, but the, the things that she gave to them. And I think that that is something uh, that has been lost in the education system. This whole idea that we, we collaborate, we learn from each other, and we develop each other's skills yeah. and we grow together. And I've worked with some really, you know, timid new teachers who in lots of places and particularly in academies now would probably be out of the door. But actually with investment, with, with good quality support, with, you know, mentoring, as Liz has talked about, you know, we, those, they, they have flourished into brilliant teachers. And we have to start investing in our education system, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The idea of working collaboratively and, and working as a team is so important. I, me personally, I was really lucky because accidentally, purely by chance, I'm, I've stumbled in my first job into Hounslow's only progressive school, uh, Andrew Ying uh, Terrorist Academy. Um, and it was the Libed. It was Hounslow's only lib ed establishment, and it was vertically grouped, and it was team teaching. And before then, I, when I trained, it was, you know, you're in there, you are God almighty, and there are 30 children over whom you have absolute control. Working as a team was brilliant, because I'm very aware that I have a, a particular skill set, and, and, and I'm rubbish at lots and lots of things that other people are good at. And we learned from each other, and we contributed our ideas. I was doing a I was doing a percent adult training course before I did this, and it was it turned into a collaborative session. Someone made one suggestion, and someone else said, "Well, you could develop that idea in that way." And someone else says something else, and before too long, you had one idea that one person had augmented and developed by a, by the collective. It was brilliant, and I was then lucky enough to work in the early years where you do work with highly skilled, highly underpaid. A nursery nurses and teaching assistants um and that was wonderful because you work as a team and you encourage each other you can share ideas and i suppose in schools now because everything is so outcome based isn't it uh you have teaching assistants but they're being downgraded i mean like they're being downgraded they're, they're being de-skilled because we get reports from places like the sutton trust that they don't contribute towards improving outcomes um, like exam results but the it's difficult for teachers to work collaboratively when there's so much pressure and when everything has been so atomized in schools um, and of course you know if you're going to look after and mentor students you need to have a proper budget that will allow you to re have release time to do that and with budget shrinking everything gets anything that can be considered superfluous to get in those outcomes is cut away, isn't it? Yeah, it is, absolutely. Um, somebody's just, uh, I think it's Deborah Hirsch, who's just commented in the chat about uh, making a distinction between secondary and primary uh, and, and a stronger need for people who are skilled in their fields. Um, I think a lot fewer education courses are needed, or maybe that's just my experience in the US. 
And I've picked up on that because I just think, uh, I don't know what your view is about other countries, what's happening in uh, globally around education, or if there's education settings globally that you think we could learn from in this country that we ought to be looking at. Because we often reflect on the US, I think. Our government often looks at what the US is doing. I'm not sure that's the most progressive education system that we would want. Are there other <laughs> examples that you think we ought to be looking at? Well, everybody, uh, everybody sort of, uh, I mean, everybody sort of goes Finland, don't they? Everybody says Finland. Uh, I would, I be, because I spent so long in early years. Uh, oh, I think there was a time when I know my, from my experience we had people from uh, America come to the school I was working at and go, "Wow, this is really good. This is this is." But that was before the national curriculum. So, uh, and I know that things like charter schools and basically payment by results and having to teach the test that they've screwed American schools down even more than the, 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 the national curriculum and SATS has here. So I don't think looking at America is as helpful as maybe say, looking at Finland. Everybody, everybody loves Finland. Um, but as an early years educator, I'd say just look anywhere else. Look anywhere else. You know, we have the Daily Mail and the Tory Graph and, and a succession of ministers from both the Tory party and the new Labour Tory party bleating about, about how our children don't do well compared to other countries and how we our children aren't as clever as children in other countries. When you look at most other countries, their early years, their kindergarten, their, uh, it lasts till seven, till they're seven. They get a play-based, experiential, non-pressurised environment no one whacks them over the head if they try to read a book. No one says, no, you mustn't read a book. Stop, go and play in the sand. But you're allowed to get all those social, gather all those important social skills, feel secure in yourself, feeling secure in yourself as a social and emotional being. And then it's easier for you to address those more formal and cognitive areas of learning, like, like reading and, and, and number. So you look around the world, everywhere else seems to be their kindergartens are brilliant. They're properly funded. And they're not just a shed tucked on at the end of a you know end of the corridor. Um, so from the word go, the, 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 this country fails its children by not giving young people a play-based experience till they're six or seven. Mm -hmm. you know, everywhere else does it, and everywhere else is better than us. So rather than going, that's what everybody else does. We ought to do that. We go no. Let's make them read earlier. Let's shove some phonics down them at five years old. That'll teach them. And it's just, you know, mad. It's just madness. But we oh, know that well, was madness. You just mentioned a word there, which is a word which I will have to cover, which is the did phonics. I, did I say the F word? Yes, you said the phonics word. And, um, you know, I have been a primary practitioner for my whole teaching career. Uh, so, you know, what do you think about the phonics assessment? Where are we going with that? What what purpose does it serve? Just out of interest. I mean, I have my view, but I'm sure you have a view. Well, since you asked, uh, how much bile and spleen can we get through? In? It's ludicrous. I mean, surely the English language coming as it does from oh, bits of Celtic, bits of Roman, bits of Anglo-Saxon, bits of the bits of Denmark, bits of France, not to mention all the other cultures that have fed in since 1066. It's the least phonetic language you could imagine, isn't it? Slough, tough, rough, enough. It's just, it just, there are more exceptions to rules. <laughs> so not only is it a ridiculous way to try and teach this marvellous, fluid language that gave us everything that's kind of exciting about this godforsaken part of the planet from Shakespeare and Webster through Jane Austen, uh, through uh, Wilfred Owen, through the music hall songs, up to Joe Strummer and The Clash and Stormzy, everything that gave us all this great rich language that, 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 that we should be proud of um, is, is being chucked out of the window. Language is not to do with imagination, it's not to do with, uh, it's not to do with meaning, it's a language for our children is reduced to barking through a mechanistic set of uh, set of meaningless was it diagraphs and phonemes. I've been in reception classes and children have gone, 
it's a split digraph. I go, oh, is it? How interesting. It's like, I don't know what split digraph is, and I don't like it, to paraphrase Joe Strummer. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't do me any good. Didn't do Shakespeare any good. Didn't do Joe Strummer any good. Uh, it hasn't helped anybody to express themselves. John Lennon didn't, wouldn't know what a split digraph was if it bit him on the Yoko Ono. So it's awful. And, and, it, it, and it, the worst thing, if you, you could imagine it ma making, making this approach even worse, is that at five and six, you make children bark through these words and half of them are nonsense, aren't they? They have to, they have to decode words like brip or splog or woof or whatever. And they're bollocks. That's bollocks. So you're teaching children that meaning isn't important in reading, that meaning isn't important in language. It's purely what's important about language is how you can be measured to do a mechanistic decoding task. Oh, that's just wicked, isn't it? Such great fun, isn't it? Why would you not <laughs> yeah. want to read a nice, enjoyable storybook? But anyway. That's right, yes. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a couple yeah. of questions in, which uh, so let's go to a couple of questions from people, and then maybe after that, Rob, we could have a little bit of chat about the current situation, yeah. COVID, and where we're at. So it's uh, from Natasha, and she the first question she asks is, I don't know much about the national curriculum. What are the pros and cons? Do you want to tell them about the pros? Then <laughs> 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 so we'll go with the, <laughs> with know, the I, <laughs> uh, I can't think of any... I, I, I'm, I'm going to be trying to be objective here. What are the pros? Well, um, we used to laugh. Oh, we used to laugh because the French education minister could say, it's, it's 10 past nine on a Monday morning, so I know that every four-year-old or every 16-year-old will be doing this at this precise moment in, in our schools. Um, so there is a kind of organisational pro to it. Um, but if you have a belief in the importance of individual diversity, the idea that something could be constructed to fit all is... It's dangerous, I think. It's like, well, we all like to wear jeans. Well, I'm wearing jeans now only because they're kind of resistant when the, you know, when I spill beer on them. But actually, we all have different sizes of jeans. Even when we're all wearing jeans, they're all different sizes because we don't fit into some sizes. So there's no such thing as one size fits all in terms of jeans. So there's no such thing. Oh, it's a lovely T-shirt. Be impressed. Look, look, look. Emma Goldman. There's no such thing as a one size T-shirt fits all. And there's going to be no one size curriculum fits all. You could probably you could probably get people who know about education, people who made it their business to study pedagogy and all the various learning styles that children have. You could probably get them to maybe agree on like an umbrella or an outline. I'm thinking of that miraculous moment when the early years foundation stage curriculum popped out of new labor when Tony Blair wasn't looking clearly. Education, education, education. And actually, although he didn't do, do away with sats, which he should have done, he didn't bring back education. He just invaded Iraq. When he wasn't looking, some clever people who know about early, early years education, who know what a four and five year old and a three year old's like, they managed to get together and say the early years foundation stage should look a bit like this mm. and by and large it was a good umbrella curriculum a good roadmap that suited your average no it suited all four and five year olds all four and five year olds could feel at home with it because they they were allowed their individuality so you could get theoretically people who knew what they were talking about together and they could come up with a kind of umbrella guidance for a national curriculum so that you could say, well, we know that all our children are receiving this kind of education. But of course, there's two things. You'd have to make it really flexible because, for example, the children who live in Guildford uh, have a very different set of life experiences 
to the children living in Bolton, not just in terms of your kind of cultural history and your lang and, and, and your accent, but also in terms of your economics. So you'd need to be able to have a curriculum to account of affluence and deprivation. Unfortunately, what we got was a curriculum that's directed at people who live in Guildford. And also what we also got is the dangerous thing about a national curriculum is if you're not careful, the state will decide what that national curriculum consists of. And it will be, as we have seen since the last 30 years, it will be a curriculum designed to further the ambitions of the state. It's not a curriculum that's designed to meet the needs of children. That unfortunately is the whole history of state education. <laughs> Chapters one and two. Um, <laughs> The wealthy have been sending their children to school since about 492, um, mainly boys. Um, and then towards the end of the 19th century, uh, with all this kind of industrial revolution and all the, all the imperialists jockeying for power, Western capitalist nations went, oh, perhaps we shouldn't just leave our poor rolling around in the mud and the mire. We might get a bit of an advance on the Germans, the French, if we taught them to operate the machines properly, if we taught them to read and write, because we might need a, 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 a class of clerks. We might need certain basic literacy and numeracy skills in our workforce. And also, oh my God, those naughty working class people, they've been getting together in trade unions and they've been organizing their own education. We don't want them doing that, do we? So let's make sure it's legal, they all have to come to our schools so we can make sure they know what they know what they're supposed to learn. So the state education, mass education, always has been a bit of a poison chalice because the state has its own agenda. And let's face it, boys and girls, only rarely does your agenda coincide with the state because most states are repressive monsters that feed on their own children. So anyway, time moves on. And what happens, of course, is 20th century, the Western capitalist nations tear themselves to bits with a couple of world wars and the, the proletariat look a bit stroppy. So there comes a moment in 1945 with the overthrow of fascism where people's aspirations want to be met. We can argue about the existence of actually existing socialists in the East. Um, in a different Zoom meeting. But for the purposes of this country, um, what we got was the welfare state, which made a kind of polite, almost Leninist new economic policy nod to the fact that really um, we can have we can have some private institutions still, that was a mistake, but really the state should need, should serve the needs of all its people. The state should serve the needs of the people. The people are the most important thing in the state, not the upper classes, not the bosses, but the people. That impacted upon education, like the NHS being created in, after the Second World War, education took a massive expansion and people wanted to use ex education and its expansion to meet the needs of children. There were successive reports by successive government committees that also featured people who knew what they were talking about, about how to improve education for our children. So from 1945, there was evolving, not a national curriculum as such, but a national consensus, a way of educating our children that peaked magnificently in the 1968 when, <laughs> when uh, we, we, we got rid of grammar schools. That's the big moment. That's the big moment because that was that's the that's the thing they hated because I, they've reclaimed the idea since then. But grammar schools, public schools, there, um, you they are gatekeepers to privilege. You go to a public school, you buy your privilege. Uh, you get you get cherry picked at eleven to go to a grammar school, then you get a leg up. You get a bit of social mobility. You can become middle class. Lucky old you, you can become a bank manager or whatever. Lucky old you. Um, but everybody else, of course, gets second. 80% of us, they, they, like, they like to talk about grammar schools, um, like it's the, but that's only 20%. 20% go to grammar schools. The rest of us go to secondary moderns, which is a bit kind of not as good as going. So that's the big thing. 
because th with with comprehensive comprehensiveization, the state the state is made to make a clear commitment to social justice, not social mobility, social justice. And then, of course, the bad fairy turns up. Margaret Thatcher turns up to roll all that socialism back. So there's a moment, post-war consensus, when the state is amen amenable to workers expressing control of their own destiny. You've got great radical teachers in the 70s. You've got the rank and file teacher movement in the NUT. Teachers who felt they had a right as professionals to know what they were doing and to organize their curriculum, and to organize their schools. So exciting, so challenging. This, there's a guy in here called Chris Searle. I just think he's wonderful. He got sacked, but he got sacked for getting his children um, in Deptford to write poetry. And they wrote this brilliant poetry about what it's like to be a working class kid in the East End of London. And, and the governors were horrified. They wanted like cheerful little Cockney sparrows singing about cheerful little women. And, and they sacked him. And the kids promptly went on strike and got him after two years and the support of the NUT reinstated. So there was this great, there's this great moment where um, education was really meaningful. It wasn't a national curriculum, but it was, it was educators taking control of their own destiny or their own responsibility professional responsibilities and it was within a kind of agreed consensus of what good education should look like and what the underlying values were so those are the pros they're not that many what we have had since i've gone on a bit sorry but what we have over the last 30 years is nothing but the nothing but the cons uh, we've got since since the 80s, we've got a system that has a very, very limited set of uh, knowledge that must be transmitted to children. It doesn't link up. It, it segments the, 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 the curriculum into different disciplines and there's no room for joined up thinking. There's no room for critical thinking. Basically, it is all about um, the, the, the child is empty. Imagine this glass is completely empty. The child comes to school completely worthless. It has no, it brings nothing. And, and then you fill it, not with red wine, but with what, what Michael Gove and tossers like him think the child needs to learn to be stupefied. You stupefy the child by pouring nonsense into it. And then what's even better is you measure how much of that nonsense the child can regurgitate. So you then can pass or fail children. Oh, you're a good regurgitator. Tick, 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 well done you. You might be socially mobile. Oh, you're a bad regurgitator. Tough luck, gutter for you, Sonny Jim. Um, and you can also fail schools as well because then you publish the scores. You, you rank schools, schools as if they're like footy teams. And so there's top of the league and there's bottom of the league. Uh, the interests of the children are nowhere in that. Nowhere at all in that. That's the biggest con. And they talk about this raises standards. It doesn't. Schools desperately have to teach to the test. They desperately have to get children to be able to jump over that hurdle. As many children as possible to jump over those hurdles. And then they get, a, they get a pat on the head if Ofsted turn up. But it doesn't encourage children to love learning. It doesn't encourage children to develop their own strengths and interests because if you don't do something that can't be measured it doesn't matter they don't care uh, i didn't know a class of, of four or five year olds that weren't absolutely expert about stuff often it was dinosaurs but they were expert about stuff well who cares <laughs> the state don't care about that. It cares if you can do split diagraphs and go blip or blonk or whatever. And it cares if you can do certain other format, but it doesn't care about your skills and it doesn't care about what you bring to your school. So the downside is it's not anything that teachers have control over. It's not anything children have control over. It's something that your centralized state has control over. And in most cases, a centralised state has an agenda that isn't ours. 
No, thanks, Rob. I mean, that was a very comprehensive response to that. I mean, I, I was born in 1968, so obviously that's why I am the way I am. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I was born in the era of fight back. But, you know, I, certainly when I first started teaching, I remember my... Uh, first post I ever got was just just as the national curriculum was coming in and I remember being told that we had to have a national curriculum because there were all these teachers out here out there who were just doing random things nobody knew what they were doing it was chaos uh, and I just thought this is ridiculous I've spent four years training I've been with really skilled teachers who know their children really well who enthuse young people to want yeah. to learn but suddenly they were just irrelevant. They didn't know what they were doing. You know, they were just random. Um, there's a really good question in the chat, which I think we ought to discuss before we move on really. Um, it says, do you tend to look back on the period before the national curriculum very positively, which, I, and like I do, even though I actually didn't teach massively uh, before the national curriculum, but was there anything that needed improvement in the curriculum? And are there any ways education improved for children over recent years at all? And I think it's worth discussing that yeah. bit because we sort of, we're always told, oh, you just hop yeah. back to the 60s and 70s and it was all, you reckon it was all brilliant. And, you know, I think it was much better then. I think we m focused much more on children and young people and their needs. That's my view. But let's reflect on, you know, is it better now? <laughs> I'm trying. I, I I really am trying. Um, I I can't. I, I don't look back on the sixties and seventies with uniformly nostalgic glasses because for every uh, Chris Searle and for every uh, rank and file teacher, there were people just kind of plodding along. Doing their best, doing chalk and talk, um, and maybe weren't as exciting as they could have been. And there were certainly children who went to school and and hated it, and found and got and got badly served by it. Um, but as a as a as a theoretical model, I think its aspirations were self improving. I think that there were teachers who were co were conscious of the challenges of social deprivation, who were conscious of the challenges of changing the changing nature of society, as moving towards post-industrialism, and they wanted to be able to equip children to meet those the changes. So I think people who knew what they were talking about had the ability to improve the model. I think the model was good in its aspirations. Um, I think I have to say that I don't think that schools are the magic wand that cures society's ills. That's something else that the that the, the, the national curriculum has lumbered us with. The schools of and education is blamed for everything. The sixties and teachers teaching with those kind of sixes and eight ideas. It's all our fault, apparently. We, you know, we, we, are, we are systematically eroding the fabric of dorking society, whatever. So, but schools cannot, they cannot compensate for the fact that your parents can't find a job or your parent can't find a job. They cannot compensate for the fact that you have a job and you still have to use a food, your family still has to use a food bank. Schools can go, can go a long way towards providing safe or welcoming social spaces for families, but they can't change the systematic inequalities with which our society is burdened and riddled. Um, I think more pressure is put. On, I think more pressure is put on schools now. So I think that their function um, is is even hard, is even harder. So I'm 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 not sure that's I'm not sure that schools do offer more for children now. I think it's interesting that schools are configured as outposts of almost like social work, 
but it's not supported by a government initiative. It's it's supported. It's a, it's a response to a catastrophe. It's a response to underfunding. It's a response to other other areas of uh, underfunding that teachers provide food for children in the morning when, when they come to school hungry. I mean, I've I would say that. I used to work with children who are disadvantaged. And by the time I stopped working, I was working with children under five who were already damaged. So there's, there is a big shift in how, in how our children come to school. And schools and teachers, because they're compassionate and inclusive entities, are trying to meet those needs. Um, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really struggling to think of any reason why school will be better now for children than it was I, the only the, that might be the only thing i can think about that schools are more more schools are more aware of their social responsibility now that's that's not a good thing that's just because society's got worse the the, the flood is upon us the deluge is upon us um whereas in the 70s there was chaos and there was deprivation, but it wasn't, there was, oh, the obvious thing of course is, we still thought we had a society. Thatch hadn't turned up because there's no such thing as society. It's just families, no such thing as society. And at no one, apart from Jezza, obviously, no one had the, no one's had the common sense to challenge that stupid narrative. No such thing as society. Okay, so so just the bins empty themselves by magic. My washing machine gets mended by magic. Oh, Margaret Thatcher, you live and die in the Ritz by magic. You know, God, cobblers. And there are so many things that we need to challenge. There are so many things like we, let's move on to let's maybe we should move on to talking about COVID. Why isn't anybody? Why isn't anybody saying whenever Boris Johnson goes, we're opening the schools, and fucking Keir Starmer goes, we're opening the schools. And they go, because the economy comes first. Why does no one say, why does no one say that? Why does no one say, of course the economy doesn't come first. Your children come first. Their teachers come first. Their parents come first. Their grandparents come first. Why does nobody say that? There are so many things we stop, we stop challenging. COVID, over to you. Over to you. <laughs> Thanks. Ah. Thanks for COVID. I mean, what I would say on that, I mean, I think that's a really um, good transfer. I mean... I think there is a whole issue and, uh, you know, I'm with you, Rob. I don't think our education system is better and I've been teaching in it for a long time. I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that we need to do. I think, the, I think you're right. I think schools recognise that there are very multiple complex situations that our children and young people are living in, but that's not a good thing. That isn't mm. good that we have to recognize that. We have more and more children living in poverty and that's outrageous. We're a very rich country. We shouldn't have children and families living in poverty, but you know, but to, to move on to COVID really, I mean, you know, it is quite shocking. I mean, I don't know. I don't know about other people. I, I'm a teacher, I drove, uh, I, I, last last week, so when we were moving up to the lockdown, uh, the new national lockdown on the Thursday, I, I drove to work on the Monday, was busy, drove to work on the Tuesday, it was busy, drove to work on the Wednesday, it was busy. Thought, oh, it's national lockdown day Thursday, so it's going to be really quiet, so I could probably leave a bit later. Drove to work on Thursday, it was busier than it was on the Wednesday. I was like, oh, hold on, we're in a national lockdown, what is happening? So, you know, there's no... We know, we all know, you know, if you, if you don't, you know, close schools and education settings, you're not going to affect what we need to affect really. And we're there to, you know, to, to open the economy. That's, that's what we're there for is schools and education settings. Having said all of that, you know, I want children and young people in schools. I know how tricky it's been for them. I talk to them. They, you know, they have found it really hard, but equally, they're really worried. So I was in a meeting last week, somebody came on, they'd been on a talk show, a young person came on, they said, on, this young person said on the talk show, to be honest, I'd rather lose two weeks in school than lose my nan. Now, that's, what, that's where our young people's heads are. Yeah. But, but that is what they're thinking. We might not be saying it to, you know, I don't say it to them, I don't say somebody might die. Yeah. In their heads, they know that. They know that this is critical 
for their communities. So yes, children and young people generally are not getting massively ill. It isn't having a massive impact on them. I get that. But those children and young people in our schools are going back to homes, are going back to people who will be much more badly affected by this virus. And those children and young people are anxious about them. And we have to, you know, we have to think about how we get the R rate down and how we manage it. But I mean, I'll just end with this and then, you know, there may be some other questions. Please put Q and A's in, uh, uh, questions in the Q and A uh, if you've got anything you want to ask Rob. But, you know, this crisis is not, has not been created by schools. It hasn't been created by young people. It hasn't been created by educators. It hasn't been created by our communities. This crisis has been created by an incompetent government who have not looked after the welfare of our people. And every time we've got to keep putting it back on them because people have really worked hard. I think workers, you know, the working class have really stood up to the mark here. And uh, this is a class war in lots of ways that we're in. And uh, we have to, you know, stand clearly on the side with workers and those people and our communities um, because it's been a really tough year, but it's not gonna get any better, I don't think, with this government. So uh, if you've got a question, please put it in the well, Q&A. Bob, I'm just, coming to you. Oh, sorry. I just wanna say that uh, in a way, I know that the NEU isn't pressing for closure because sadly we've lost we've lost the political support, support of, that we had with Rebecca Long Bailey, who was a sensible spokesperson in the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting the way that you're talking about, re, you know, rotor systems. And what, what I think we need to do is use this as an opportunity to, to say uh, our schools need to be repurposed. And why do our young children go to school? They go for developmental reasons. They go for social and emotional development. They go to learn things. My experience is, if you're interesting, if you provide an interesting experience, children will learn. Uh, I used to, uh, I spent seven years teaching year six children, and I don't think there's a lot of difference between them and between them and five year olds. If you provide a stimulating environment, they'll just go off like rockets. And I believe the same is true of 17 and 18 year olds. That's why a national curriculum is awful because it, it's making it, making teachers teach something that children aren't going to go off like rockets on. But what we need to do with, with COVID is to okay, I think let's repurpose our schools. Let's think about what our children's real. Why do our children go to school? It's not to learn phonics. It's to go off like a rocket. Let's let's maybe have like rotor systems. Let's reduce shifts. Let's reduce the number of children going to school. Let's make sure they have a quality experience when they're there that gives them what they need that gives them the social emotional experiences they need with their friendships and, and also gives them some learning opportunities that are meaningful for them. Um, and let's not, but let's not force young children to go back to school with this big stick of, oh, you'll be falling behind. Falling behind what? Some arbitrary yardstick that uh, comes with the national curriculum. Well, we know that's arbitrary because they, because the way they shift the, you know, the, the maths results of 2017. 85% of the children uh, didn't pass, but because you needed a number of children to pass, they say you passed. So what we, we need to make sure that our children go for a really good educational experience. We don't just sit them in rows and, tr and try and cram them with stuff so that their outcomes will be good. And I, I fear that's what's happening because everybody's come back to school. Everybody has to keep up, keep up, keep up, keep up. So they're not getting a good education experience. And we need to remember before COVID that actually there's a great deal of dissatisfaction with the national curriculum and a great deal of dissatisfaction with the stress that an outcomes-based high stakes curriculum leads to. So more children, I believe, I think Kevin Courtney says this, were uh, worried about their performance. They were more worried about their performance in exams. They were about bullying. Well, I'm glad you're not worried about bullying, but I'm, I'm more worried about the fact that they're, more, they're actually worried about failing in schools. Our schools weren't fit for purpose. In 2019, the Labour Party and even the Liberal Dumbocrats Party, they agreed to scrap SATs. We knew that the national curriculum and an outcomes-based curriculum isn't good for children. I fear that that's what children get when they go back to school now because there is this idea that they won't be able to catch up. Isn't it Ofsted saying they've lagged behind? 
lag behind what? So we need to take this opportunity as educationalists to advocate for any return should be repurposed to meet the real needs of children, not just so they can catch up. No, I think that's a really important important point, Rob, and thanks for that. Uh, I think the other thing is uh, you pointed out that, and I, I certainly went back um, teaching before the summer, we had much smaller class sizes, it was much easier to social distance, to have much more interactive teaching, whereas now you've got full classes. I mean, we have some of the biggest classes going, you know, here in the UK. Um, sort of globally and certainly in Europe and uh, it's you know children are sat in rows I mean the government mm. must be absolutely mm. reveling in the whole yes. you know they've actually got what they wanted just by the fact that we've got to try and keep these kids away from each other so you know we've suddenly gone to a system of children sitting in rows which none of us want um, yeah. so it's a really it's really tough but I think the blended learning particularly at secondary level where some children are in some children are out but also, you know, we know there are supply teachers out there that could be employed by schools. There should be Nightingale schools. It's open up spaces so we have much smaller class sizes in primaries so that we can have children in, but have them socially distanced, but also be doing some of that interactive teaching that we want. There's a question from a trainee teacher in the chat. So, so she says, as a trainee teacher who feels very much the same as you in regards regards to the national curriculum, what do you suggest I can personally do to make a change? I think that's quite, you know, we have to support, there are lots of educators coming in who don't like what they come into, but are committed to education and want to make a difference. How can we support them? I think, um, I think the, the best thing I would say is join the National Education Union for start off, because it's it, you need you need to feel you're part of a collective. You need to look for a collective. Uh, if you want to make if you want to make a difference, you want to look for a collective. Organised within the school you go to um, is a good thing to do. So you can't get you can't get picked off. Oh, and maybe you might have to stand up and be awkward. Be awkward. I loved it. <laughs> I spent thirty five years being. It was great fun. Um, and, but you need to look for opportunities to express your ambitions to make things better for children. You need to actively look for opportunities to meet the needs of your children rather than the state. You need to be proactive. Um, it, I'm sure you sound like you want to be a proactive teacher. Stick to it. Stick to it. And, and look for look for support with, with any, within any workplace you, get, you go to. Uh, organise, organise, organise in the workplace uh, and organise nationally in, in, in the, I think, uh, it's not just, I think the NEU is a really good union um, because it has a, con it has a, con has, it has more concerns for pedagogy, uh, as, as more concerns for pedagogy as it has for kind of members' rights. It's pretty good, on, it's good on members' rights, but it's good on pedagogy as well. And, Having that, uh, having people who are committed to good quality education, that's really important. So, yes, be prepared to be awkward, but look for friends um, and be active, be proactive. I think uh, what I would say is be creative, be confident yeah. in what you do, enjoy your teaching. Uh, so that's what I've always done in the classroom. I've been confident. I've done what I think is right for my children and young people, and I've never been criticised for that. Because uh, if you are happy and your children are happy, they're learning and people can see that when they come in. They don't need, you know, wherever I go and, and I teach, I want my children to be happy, to be engaged and to enjoy what they're doing. And when they're doing that, anybody that comes in, in some ways, it doesn't really matter what you're doing because they just see kids that are engaged and are learning. And that they're, that's what people are interested in, really. Um, Lots of the people that come in that want to criticise people actually haven't taught or don't have much experience. So really, they want to be critical about minimal things. And if you're just confident in yourself, that's a much better position to be in. That's the way I've always been. I teach the way I want to teach. And um, I've always been that way. And I think that's what we've got to do. We've got to take back our profession. We're professionals. Yeah. We know what we're doing. 
we've learned, we know how to teach our children and young people and we know what is best for them, not people coming in to criticise us. So I think definitely do that. But yeah, get involved in the union because uh, I think that's a really good place to be. Um, somebody's it's asked, also, Rob, I'll go on, Rob, and then I've no, got another question oh, Sorry, you. it's also, yeah, that's absolutely right. Sorry, Louise, yeah, but th that's right. Happy children. Uh, make your children happy. Um, everybody should go home happy from school. That should be the main aim. But if your children are happy, they'll come to school, they'll come into your classroom happy because it's going to be a rocket of a place to be. They're going to have a great time and they're going to go home justified. And so if your children are happy, then learning will take, will, the learning will take place and that will help, that will help kind of elbow out the, the moaners and grumblers who might go, me, 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 you're not ticking that box enough, me, me, whatever. So, but, but yeah, and of course, that's what you're there for, isn't it? To make people happy. And when they're happy, they'll learn because that's what they want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When I, I've got two children who are now uh, early 20s and uh, late teens, and uh, both of them went through the very hostile you know, SATs curriculum, bloody, bloody, blah, blah, blah. And I used to always throw, because I used to turn up to parents' evening and uh, the teacher would want to show me a chart of where they were at uh, in their levels. And I, I just used to say, uh, are they happy? And they, they used to go, oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm happy in school. And I'd say, I'm happy then. If they're happy, they're learning. And that would just completely throw the teacher. <laughs> My view has always been if my children are happy in school, if they're content, if they feel comfortable, if they feel valued, they'll learn. And both of my children learn very well through that method. So without me knowing whether they were, you know, in the green box, the blue box, the red box, <laughs> the box the teacher had, I really didn't want to know because I don't like my child being put in a box. I like them to be able to expand and develop as an individual. Um, <laughs> No, uh, just, most parents do, don't they? I think most parents do. It's, a, it's that kind of fiction that, again, is imposed on most parents. So if you say, they go, are they happy? You go, yeah, that's, that's, that's what you want, isn't it? You want it. Your... Child's happy. Yeah. They're going to learn. Um, so just, I'm going to move on to a question about homeschooling, because this is quite an interesting question, actually. I'm pleased yeah. to ask question, because... Um, a couple of years ago, I did quite a lot of stalls around um, the, the baseline test. So uh, for too young to test. And you'll love that, Rob. You'll have loved the baseline test. So I'm sure you can talk about that. Uh, wax lyrical about the baseline <laughs> test. But I did a lot of stalls uh, here, but also across the country, actually, um, as a national officer around the baseline test, opposing our four years, four year olds being tested. And at that time, I met a lot of parents who were taking their children out of education. And what they talked to me about was that they felt that children were too pressured, too young, and that they didn't want to put their children through that sort of system. And a, a question has come up in the chat saying, uh, you know, are, is there more homeschooling? Do we think that that, it, it, you know, that it is because of the way our education system has become? And I just wonder what you think about that, Rob. Yeah, I can, under, I, I, I can understand that because it's the fault of the... Oh God, we have a system. That, we have a system now because it's so outcomes-based that it excludes people, that it doesn't... It thinks it thinks won't help their outcomes. Um, and the children within schools are so pressurised. Um, I remember the great... You remember the great uh, parents' strike? Uh, was it May the 3rd? That was brilliant. So... Parents are quite rightly increasingly unhappy about what's happening in their schools. Um, and is the solution to homeschool? I, I've had friends who homeschool um, and at some point I would say they think that they've kind of run out of things to homeschool the children about and they find that their children are probably ready to or need to go into a larger environment in order to make those social and emotional connections that with the best will in the world, us as parents, we can't give our children. Um, my friend Neil from Reading, who is 200% uh, anarchist, was thinking of homeschooling. And I, and I said, because he knew I was a teacher, and I went, well, 
it'll be a shame. It'll be a shame for any class to miss having your child in it, basically, because your child and Neil's, a child of Neil's and Angie's, obviously, will bring certain attitudes and energies into the class that would, would be a lot of much welcomed by the other children. So Neil stuck with state education, and he was really chuffed that he did. Um, and his children were up fine, and that was good. Other friends have kept children off, but then at some point decided that actually there is something about going into that wider that wider community. I'm going to quote from the book now, and it's not me talking. Um, God, where is it? Homeschooling. Um, I, 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 as a parent, I, I love, I love our sons more than possibly I could ever say. And separating at any time from them just brings tears to my stupid little eyes. But I, I knew that I couldn't give them. I couldn't give them what they need. They're not mine. You know, there's something else in here as well. Children, not, children belong to themselves. They're not ours. They're themselves. They belong to their, they, I believe they belong to themselves and their friends and their comrades. Um, and not ours. We have, it's important that, that, they, that they take those steps into school. That's, that's why a good school is so important because it allows children to take those steps away from the safety that you want to create for them in a supported way. The problem, of course, is when schools are hostile, which is increasingly where they are now. So then I think parents have a right to make that judgment and maybe should dip in and out of school. Maybe should maybe should homeschool for a bit and, and maybe reintroduce. Here's, here's what I got. This is a, it's a great book. Um, called uh, No <laughs> Problems Without Adult Authority. It's really good. And it's got a whole load of... Uh, this is from um, uh, a woman called Kathleen, o Kathleen Nicolo Nicole O'Neill, The Problem with Unschooling. She's in favour of, of homeschooling. Uh, I think this is really important. She says, the idea of unschooling gives parents tremendous control over children's lives. For all their problematic aspects, most traditional educational institutions allow young people something of a scope of autonomy, however limited, beyond the reach of their immediate families. And they also provide youth with exposure to people of diverse backgrounds and belief systems of the sorts their parents may not associate with. Furthermore, it's difficult for a young person who spends virtually all of her time around her parents or those people the parents both know and explicitly endorse the child associating with to develop a strong sense of independence. This I'm sure doesn't apply to any of us, but most disturbingly of all, unschooling gives the most dangerous parents even more scope for abuse of their authority, whether it involves indoctrinating their child into questionable political or religious beliefs or allowing sexual, emotional or physical abuse to occur with impunity. That's not anything I think we need to worry, you know, but there are downsides to homeschooling and I think the advantages of letting your children go, they need to be able, you need to be sure they're going into a supported and safe environment. The problem with our current system is for many children, it's not there. Schools are pressurized. Not all schools are able to give all children what they need. Schools aren't as inclusive as, inclusive as they ought to be. So it's difficult. I, my, I have friends who homeschool and they've done really good. Their kids are great and they've had a lovely time. I would have loved to have homeschooled our children, but no, that actually, uh, even they would tire of endless listening to Velvet Underground records and watching normal wisdom films. They need to go somewhere that doesn't watch normal wisdom films all day. I mean, it's interesting, Rob. I think it's a really good point. And the biggest thing that came up actually from the year six that I'm teaching at the moment, post lockdown, is that they miss their friends. They really, really miss that contact with other children of the same age as them, even though they might have siblings, they didn't have siblings with the same age as them um, or whatever. I mean, I think there is an issue, for me, there's a massive issue around parents having a control over what happens to their children in school. For example, I think, mm. I think parents should be able to say, I don't want my 
child to sit a phonics test. I don't want my child to have to be bit sat. Do you know what I mean? I think in that way, you give parents that element of, well, actually those bits aren't very nice. I don't want them to have to face. You know, yeah. I don't want to know that my child is a failure because that's what they get told yeah. at the age of six if they haven't passed the phonics test. I don't want to know that. I like reading books with them. You know, I had a, I've got two children, one of them, you know, didn't really read till sort of seven, eight, but the other one read much earlier, but they're both really good readers. Yeah. You know, it's not that they're, either of them is a failure, but probably one of them would have failed the phonics test, you know, but does that make her a failure as a reader? She's a really good reader now. It just, you know, we, we all develop at different times. So I think, you know, what's your view on that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the whole point of having uh, professionals being able to make judgments about children's development, isn't it? Um, we we do know that people develop at different times and different rates and they have different learning styles. So obviously you don't you don't want to have a system which has sudden death moments where you get stamped and labelled. You get stamped and labelled at because isn't that oh God, the awful point of the baseline test, isn't it? You stamp them as they come in and you're supposed to pre predict how they're going to leave at 11. And if they if they don't leave at the right stamp level, then not only have they failed, but the school's failed as well. It's ridiculous. We, God, we're such complicated, wonderful mechanisms. We have, we have so much that is magical about us. And... And to think of us having to send our children onto some conveyor belt, the stamps us and, and, and you know, uh, does some, some, some sort of strange quality control at, at, at certain junctures that then determine what happens to them in the future. It's ridiculous. And, and you, wouldn't want to send, you wouldn't want to send your child into, into that situation unless you felt confident that the teachers were doing their best to subvert that nonsense. I mean, I have to say, I mean, I tell this story quite a lot, but my youngest daughter went to secondary school and it was the only secondary school in uh, the city that wasn't an academy. So obviously I sent her there and uh, it converted to an academy in the first year of her being there, which I was furious about. But anyway, uh, and suddenly I, I got books home from her school where there was a flight path on the front of her book. So there was a bit and literally... There was a picture of her on top of a plane on a diagonal line like that. So yeah. somehow children yeah. learn like yeah. that. And I, I was just like, I'm sorry, I don't know about the rest of you in this school, but as an educator, I genuinely know that children do not learn on a diagonal line. Sometimes she's going to make really good progress, but yeah. sometimes it might just, you know, be like that. And that's okay. I'm happy with yeah. that. And, uh, we sort of have got into this system as a, an education system. And I, I'm really worried about that. And I think that might be why parents feel that they're pushed out. You know, there's almost this view yeah. that there's this one system, we've all got to go this way. If your child doesn't fit on that line, yeah. they're not in. They're not in the team, you know. It's that whole uh, yeah. this way or no way, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's awful. The, 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 the lineal model of education. And we don't live our lives like that. We, we, we go around in circles. We do the same thing again because we enjoy it. We go around in spirals. We go out, we turn our back and touch base with ourselves. That's, life isn't a... If it's, a, if, it's a, you know, if it's like just one line, outcome-based, we might as well just climb into the wooden box and nail ourselves flat now because that's where we're going. Let's accelerate the process. Let's, let's yeah, like, like absolutely. That. I mean, Heather's just said this in the chat. It's not right yeah. to make it look like the child is not complete and is on her or his way to some final place. They are complete right now. They are. Yeah. They're wonderful individuals and we should celebrate all of them. Um, there's, there's another question in the Q&A, which I'll go to. Then uh, I, I think maybe if there's anything you want to ask Rob or you want to cover before or anything you want to read from the book, uh, before we sort of start to sum up, uh, Rob, just to let you know, do not leave because Rob is going to sing for us at the end and 
I know what a treat that is. I've heard Rob sing quite a lot recently and he's got some great songs. So do not leave early because it's a treat to behold. But um, somebody's just asked about people leaving the profession. And I know uh, through the union that there's a mass exodus of people very early on. And how do we try and tackle that? Because we're used, you know, we're losing this mass of young people who are committed to it. You know, what I know is, I'm, I'm sure you're the same, Rob. I, from a very young age, actually, uh, wanted to be a teacher. And that was my trajectory. Mm. I did everything I could through my education to make sure I got to be an educator, a teacher. Um, and I've stuck it out for 30 years, just like you. But, yeah. you know, lots of people now are leaving very early. And I know why. I can sort of see why. But how do we draw them back in? What, what can we do to re-engage those people and not lose those people from the profession? That's really difficult, isn't it? Because you, you talk, we have somehow to find a way of of changing the whole culture of schools because you 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 come into you come into education because you want to make a difference, you want to be that that person who who helps at light bulb moments. Not the I, I believe most most teachers don't think they're gonna come and like they're gonna come and fill you up with knowledge like that, but they 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 genuinely want to make a difference, and that difference means helping young people negotiate the difficult difficult years. They're all difficult. I mean, I, I don't think I don't think my life's got any years as I've got older. They're all difficult years. The great thing about school is you're in an environment that cares about you and wants to make it good for you. And that's why that's why people are there. Um, so you've got to change that culture. Uh, I mean, I suppose it means that those of us in education must work harder to o overturn those elements that grind our young teachers down, that make them feel they're not going to make a difference, that make them feel worthless. Of course, it's in the state, state's interest to get rid of you young teachers, because after a couple of years, you might be gaining some strategies, you might be gaining some resilience, you might be wanting to express your professional autonomy. You might be wanting to say, no, that's nonsense. So they want to get you out quickly before you start doing that. And then someone else will come in on a, you know, a, 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 few, a few weeks of study over the summer and then on the job training. So you'll get a compliant work, you'll get a compliant workforce inflicting compliance on a compliant student population. That's what they want. So don't give it to them. If you can stick it out, stick it out. Look for friends. Your colleagues will be the people to keep you going. Don't let them, oh, don't let them divide and rule. Find friends, support each other, stick up, stick up for each other in schools, young teachers. Okay. But if you do that and you, and you get involved in collective organisations, that's, that'll help, that, that will kind of help you, I think. And you've got to maintain, I think, got to help people maintain a distance um we've got to we've got to make people understand that it's a job but it's it's a holy calling yes but it's also a job it's just what you do but it's not it's not it's not it don't let schools i think schools try and bleed you dry don't they, they try and get as much out of you as they can they give you extra responsibilities they give you all sorts of pressures and they're happy to use you out and spit use you out and spit you out so we have to try and encourage people to stand up for themselves. And as educators, we have to create a culture of standing up for ourselves. I was so proud to be in the NEU when they wouldn't let the schools reopen in June. I, 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 I don't always agree with some of the decisions my un, our union makes. I, I think it could perhaps be a bit more proactive over certain things, but I was really proud that we do we stood up for our members and we said no we're not you're not doing that we need to do more we need as a profession we need to do more of that we need to stand up for ourselves um and then hopefully if you're feeling if you feel like leaving you'll you'll give it you'll give it a bit longer you'll feel that you'll be supported and we should look to support our, our young teachers as well apart from that we do not <laughs> I think, I mean, I agree. I think look for teachers that look like they enjoy being there. 
Okay, so I go into I get into school early in the morning. I skip along the corridor because I love the thrill of going in. I love teaching kids. So find teachers that want to be there. That's what I do. I engage with people that are positive about what they're doing because those are the people that you want on your side. You want the people that enjoy what they're doing, that see it as a positive experience because that, and this isn't a criticism, but there are some people that are very tired of what is happening. And sometimes so what you don't need is negative drains. You need people that are positive and that are prepared to go out there and do something different. So look around for people that are happy, that come in skipping, that are smiling at children, that are joyous. Yeah. I, view. I want people that are joyous, that want to be there, that are happy about it. Um, and yes, it's not brilliant in schools right now. I agree with that. And the national curriculum, I don't agree with. I don't agree with the tests. I don't agree with loads of stuff. But I go in, I deliver, I engage, I enjoy being with the children and young people. I want them to be happy. I want them to want to come to school. I want them every day to smile at me as I walk out onto the yard and be pleased to see me in the way that I'm pleased to see them. And that's what I look for in other educators around me. Yeah. So, Rob, uh, okay, this is the penultimate, this is the last question, what we're going to do about it. That's, this is what the, about it. <laughs> what we're going to do about it, Rob, I think a revolution is an order person. Yes, anyway, that'd be a good idea. The revolution, what's your answer? Um, work towards the revolution. Nothing is ever wasted. Um, the, 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 the great heart I take from this whole episode is that after 30 years of having the full weight of the state and all its apparatus behind it, the media, uh, they still haven't managed to finish us. <laughs> we know that academies are rubbish. We are starting to overturn uh, academies. I've been blessed to be part of two I think two successful anti-academy campaigns we beat the bastards back we can do it yeah. we we organize in our unions in our communities and we can we can face them off so after 30 years of having having all the resources of the state all the mad cat money that michael gove has been able to throw at his pet hobby horses none of it's worked that's the that's the most amazing. None of it's worked as well as we have. Whatever their league tables go, ooh, year on year, blah, blah, blah. They haven't done the work. We've done the work. We've done our best to send children out happy, to send children out as equipped as we can. We could do a lot better without the national curriculum. We've still done our best. They still don't like us. I mean, they still don't like us. In 2016, the Academy... The academy uh, project is the wheels have fallen off it. Everybody knows it's corrupt. Everybody knows that academies don't do any better than state schools. And so uh, Gideon Osborne goes, well, actually, every school is going to be an academy by 2020. He makes this decree. And, oh, OK, so you've lost, haven't you? You've lost. You've lost. You haven't beaten us. So you're going to have to, you're going to pull your, your magic chance and just check a trump card out and go, you're all going to, whether you like it or not. Well, we're not all academies. We won. You you haven't beaten us. So that's heartening. The fact that everybody knows they're useless. I think that's one of the things the book's trying to say. They're useless. They're useless. Government of government for the privileged, by the privileged, of the privileged is useless. And we've resisted them. So that's really heartening. COVID is, is an opportunity for us to say. Let's, let's reconfigure our schools. We know you're, you, we know it's useless. It's now time. It's now time to move forward, and that's it, it's encouraging to think that the union uh, was able in 20, in June 2020 to to stand up to the government and say no, we're not going back. So that's encouraging. These are these are good moments. The last the last four years haven't been wasted. We be, we feel we're empowered, so we just keep going towards the revolution. That's a, a brilliant summing up, Rob, and I think you're right. You know, we often think that there has to be some big win, but actually little wins oh. are good. 
Little wins are yeah. good. We have to just keep fighting. There's no ultimate win. We have to keep fighting um, towards a better system for our children and young people. And, you know, uh, Rob's mentioned the union. People need to get involved in their unions. People need to get involved in their local communities. There's lots of yeah. local communities that are working together during the crisis. Um, but I'm going to sort of end with this, right? You, you know, you need to read the book because that's why we're all here. I've read it. It's a brilliant book. Um, and it ju just sort of made me re-reflect, you know, I, I, you know, I read lots, lots of things, but, you know, it's a good, it's a book that, you know, just reminds us that there is a different way. And it, it's a positive book, you know, sometimes books can get you down, just gets you down a bit at times, but, you know, it's got an upward, you know, this is where we're going and that's important. Um, and we need to reflect on what has happened and retake control in our education system. And I think Rob has sort of summarised that brilliantly. We haven't talked about one system, which I would have liked to talk about, but we're not going to now because Rob's going to do his songs in a minute. But, you know, we should get rid of Ofsted. We should definitely get rid of Ofsted. And I know Rob would agree with that. Yes. Put his thumbs up straight away. So yes. Ofsted is the worst system that just yes. is absolutely destroying our schools. But... And he talked about it in the book. So that's a good reason to read the book because we haven't talked about it. So read the book and then you'll know why. Um, so, you know, I wanted to finish for half past and I think we're probably going to be able to do that. So we are really lucky. I, Rob sings at some other events that I go to and I love listening to Rob sing. He, he just holds things together about the education system in such a clear way through his songs. And I think they should be published, Rob. I don't know why we haven't got... This is a good book. We need a good CD of these education songs. So that's what that's our next uh, challenge, Rob, to you. Um, but I want to thank all of you that have joined us. I've really enjoyed being here. I, I do a lot of Zoom meetings. Some of them uh, hurt my head. This one has been <laughs> I've really enjoyed just chatting with you, Rob. And yes, thank me too. all thank of you. you that have asked really good questions. And uh, I think, yeah. you know, we're in it together. We're, you know, we can make a difference. We have made a difference. We do make a difference. Every day, yeah. all of us make a difference. Yeah. So we're important and we have to hang on to that. And uh, I'm going to hand back to Rob to, to, to close us with his uh -huh. magic of magic. And uh, thank you very much, everyone. And particularly to Housemans for hosting yeah. it. Thank you, yeah. Christina. Great job. Rob, over to you. I I think one of the important things is why they hate school so much is it's because we all it's where we all get together, isn't it? We are a community. They've destroyed uh, industries and our communities, but they can't they can't destroy our schools because they have to send the children have to go there, and that's the place where children can learn stuff that's not in the daily blurg or not pouring out the bile of social media or not Britain's got no talent or whatever they can listen to they, they just we just learn stuff that's why our schools are so vital and we we just need to reclaim them because because all sorts of magic can happen there like Charlie's watering the mud he says I'm going to go a tree so it's set in the early years, but I'm sure 16 and 17 year olds have the same kind of same kind of experiences. Charlie's watering the mud. He's got this plastic watering can that's half as big as his friend Zach, so he has to hold it with both hands. Charlie's watering the mud, he says. I'm gonna grow a tree. It's gonna reach up to the sky. It's gonna be as big as me. Whoa, yeah. Little people, big ideas. Whoa, yeah. Little people, big ideas. And Charlie says to Zach, of course, now we have to paint it blue. So Zach and Charlie paint the mud. Kajay joins in too. And Imo watches thoughtfully because Kajay's paint is sort of red. And as the mud turns sort of 
purple. It will be beautiful. She says, whoa, yeah. Little people, big ideas. Whoa, yeah. Little people, big ideas. You keep on watering that mud, Charlie. Okay, sometimes it ends in tears. Then again, you might end up, Charlie, on the Galapagos Islands. On the Galapagos Islands. Nathan's watering the mud and half the class are growing trees and half the class are building rivers that one day are gonna make it to the sea and Kerry wants to paint the walls red but finds an acorn green as spring so we dig a hole in Charlie's mud and drop tomorrow's oak tree in. Little people, big ideas. Oh, yeah. Little people, big ideas. Oh, yeah. Little people, big ideas. Oh, yeah. Little people, big ideas. Last of all, this has got two choruses. It's got the um, the inner four-year-old chorus, and then later on it's got the GCSE chorus. Here's the inner four-year-old. It goes na 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 Sphinx likes the Beatles and the Kinks Living in a council house Quieter than a council mouse Never past 11 plus Rides the number 13 bus To the secondary modern Where she gets forgotten Mum and Dad work all the hours Edie's good at growing flowers And Edie likes to sing along To her favourite Beatles song All you need is love Love, love All you need is love Love, love, all you need is love. Love, love, and comprehensive schools. Well, Esmeralda Fortescue spends her whole life feeding blue. A lovely house, a lovely home, a lovely garden all her own. Goes to such a lovely school to learn her Latin grammar rules. How can you be lonely when you've got a pony? She practices her scales for hours. She's not allowed to pick the flowers. Mummy's never ever there. And Daddy likes the new old pair. And all you need is love, love, love. All you need is love, love, love. All you need is love, love, love. And comprehensive schools. Na, 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 na. Because every child should have the chance to learn to grow and sing and dance. It doesn't matter where you're from, you can go wherever you want. Round the corner, over the moon, beyond the stars, it's up to you. Whether you're Edie Annie Sphinx or Esmeralda Fortis Skin. Well, all you need is. Love, love, all you need is love. Love, love, all you need is love. Love, love, and comprehensive schools. Na, 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 na. Funded, 
free from centralised state interference. Comprehensive school. Thanks, Rob. What a oh, brilliant thanks. way to end as ever. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank thanks, you to Louise. all of you for attending. Thanks to Housemans for hosting us. And don't forget to read the book. It's amazing. And we'll see you all soon. Lovely to see you all. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.